Well, there are unconfirmed reports that the RSF may, may now also pull out of the talks. Um, but either way, I think what the talks are showing us is that there's a battle of wills going on between the Sudanese Armed Forces and the, and the uh, Rapid Support Forces. They both want to be seen as legitimate partners for peace, but they're, the way that they want to get there differs vastly. It's very clear that neither of them are interested in a ceasefire. The RSF has been uh, shelling parts of al Fashif town in Darfur. They have been um, making uh, displacing people in parts of White Nile State. And they have been, um, you know, carrying out all sorts of atrocity violence across the, the country in order to better position themselves militarily for the, the talks in Geneva. Um, and that similarly, the Sudanese Armed Forces has been um, really moving the goalposts with the American mediators in the hopes of extracting some uh, political and security guarantees ahead of the talks. These are the guarantees that they hope will position them better to win the war militarily. So really, we're not seeing any significant push towards a ceasefire here. Let's talk about the behavior, the behaviors of the two belligerent forces. Uh, the RSF said in principle that they are going to attend the talks and uh, the Sudan Armed Forces uh, have been on record saying that uh, they will not talk to RSF unless RSF pulls out of the areas they occupied since uh, April 15. Is that a realistic references or demand that these two parties are putting on the table? It, it is not. Uh, it's, even though it may be justified, it is not a realistic uh, prospect. And the, and the SAF knows this. They know that they are asking the RSF uh, to abide by the May uh, 11th agreement of last year when it would be tactically unwise for the RSF to leave people's homes because that is what it is providing them cover in Khartoum. So militarily, um, the RSF is not going to see any value in, in, in implementing the May 11th agreement. SAF knows this very well, and it is by design that they are insisting on this agreement being implemented when they themselves have not really implemented the agreement. This allows them to say that the, you know, that they will not be they're, they're not being met part way. They have made other insistences. They wanted to, the head of the Sudanese Armed Forces to be referred to as the head of the Sovereignty Council. Of, of course, that's the body that was dissolved with the 2021 coup, and which which the Americans granted. And they have also asked for a face to face with the American delegation ahead of the talks in in Switzerland which again, the Americans granted. Um, so we are seeing a lot of bad faith engagement here from both SAF and the RSF, knowing that neither of them is in interested in a ceasefire. And they're also putting uh, putting down a lot of obstacles that they know are immovable or impassable in order not to get to a situation where they have to commit to a ceasefire. And you have been on record uh, talking and advocating for peace in Sudan. And, uh, you know, it's an open secret that you came to the United States specifically to engage with U.S. policy makers and diplomats at the U.N. who really look at the issues in Sudan with a lot of seriousness. What are some of the feedbacks you're getting? Well, I came to the, uh, to the United States to deliver a, an intervention at the U.N. Security Council, particularly on protection. And that is the main takeaway message here. Um, or I think a lot of people's efforts, which is that quite clearly a ceasefire is not coming. But even if a ceasefire were to to be cobbled together, it would it has not historically led to uh, many lives being saved. In fact, we see the opposite with a ceasefire. Ahead of a ceasefire and after a ceasefire, we see an uptick in violence. New uh, political compositions are created through a ceasefire. There's very little ability to implement a ceasefire at the local level with local uh, troops, even if that top brass of, of both sides are able to sign onto a ceasefire. So really, the, the, I think the aim of the game right now, the, the task of the day, is protection, ensuring that we are we're able to put in place the kinds of protection mechanisms, um, including community protection mechanisms, including monitoring of human rights and, and, and abuses, including uh, getting proper data around what is happening to people and enabling them to better support themselves against some of this atrocity, violence, sanctions. Um, responses and consequences to violence being committed. Actually, those are the kinds of things that would also, in due course, the groundwork for a much more sustainable ceasefire. The Human Rights Watch issued a statement in July calling for boots on the ground in Sudan. Specifically, they are asking for a protection force to be deployed in the in the country. But looking at what is going on in Sudan, the situation is quite uh, complicated. And uh, adding 
troops on the ground, foreign troops rather, would, uh, you know, worsen the situation? Do you subscribe to the notion that uh, there needs to be boots on the ground in Sudan to deter the warring parties from abusing civilians? I don't think that bringing in uh, foreign troops would increase the violence. That hasn't. That's not borne out by Sudan's history. What we saw when there was a Chapter 7 boots on the ground intervention with the United Nations African Union Mission in Darfur or UNAMID in the t- mid-2000s was actually um, that that was served as a protective wedge between civilians and the, uh, the different parties at the time, both SAF and the RSF actually, that were um, targeting them, particularly on ethnic grounds. Um, those kinds of missions are large, they're expensive, they're not always um, as effective as we would like them to be, but they have served so far when there is such a protection vacuum, when we know that neither party is willing or capable of uh, protecting civilians, they have served as a, a, the only means really that we have to ensure that there is that protective wedge. What we have today is far worse in terms of scale than what we had 20 years ago. So it's not a surprise that Human Rights Watch and other entities have evaluated that actually something of that nature is exactly the kind of thing we need to be looking at in order to make sure that civilians' lives are protected.